Juan. Happy Sinterklaas, San Nicolás, Saint Nicolás, Spanish Constitutional Day, all of the Ngombang holidays. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next generation of medical devices enabled by Photonics. Welcome back. If you look closely at medical devices over the last couple of years, you will be absolutely amazed. I have never seen something like this, with so many new devices being launched to improve public health and well-being. But do you know what they all have in common? They need to be manufactured in very large volumes. And it is quite incredible just how much photonics is playing to accelerate innovation and adding important functionalities to these devices. However, until now, it has proved very difficult for photonics technologies to enter that playing field of volume production outside the telecom sector and with the exception of my beloved pixels in mobile phones. Luckily, 2021 has been one of the most magical years for photonic integration. And so we're able to measure a whole plethora of biomarkers continually using the optical signal coming out of the chip, shining into your skin harmlessly and looking at the light coming back. Um, but all the, the parameters that we're able to measure here, we ultimately hope that we will be able to get FDA clinical approval for them. Yeah, so this, this is a reference design device that we use for our human studies and to help our customers. Our, our okay. customers are, you know, the global leaders in, in wearable device technology and wearable devices. Note that Andy Rickman said we are bringing photonics to volume production. And now it is true. We have the micro and nano optics. We have the mature photonic integrated circuits, the mature medical fiber technology, and we have the ways to package and assemble these devices to be fully medical compliant. And most important, we have the industry need to bring those technologies as far as possible to form factors that are already used. I am thinking, of course, about mobile phones, smartwatches, smart clothes, or smart glasses or rings. In fact, the smart version of things that are already on us. How do the large medical companies see this trend? Will they leave it all to Google or Apple to invest in this? The answer is no. Medical companies are no longer strangers to photonic integration. More and more often, they see companies like Medtronic, Stryker, Merck, Philips, or ST Microelectronics present at our meetings and engaging with our members. Merck, Philips, and ST Microelectronics are committed EPIC members. And another important trend is the use of the Internet of Things to maximize the amount of data collected by an individual, not necessarily a patient yet. This explains the collaboration between Stryker and Microsoft, as Dan Martinsog explains. Historically, when we'd have access to a product, it was only during a service event. What the Internet of Things has allowed us to do is to really capture data continuously. Having access to the data allows us to more quickly respond to the needs of our uh, products that are in the field to make those products better. And we see tremendous opportunity for a growing portfolio of devices by harvesting this data from these connected products, turning that data into information and sharing it back with our customers, both clinical and non-clinical. We feel that we can positively affect patient outcomes. Although possible, miniaturization and implementation of medical principles into wearables requires serious investment. Take, for example, the company Diamond Tech. Here comes the great Thorsten Lubinsky. Diamond Tech stands for Diabetes Monitoring Technology, and we have developed a new way to measure blood glucose non invasively, that means without finger pricking. We are actually looking directly for the glucose molecule. We are basically counting the glucose molecules in your skin and measure your blood sugar that way. That's why we are so accurate, all non-invasive. And now you see my result. Congratulations, Thorstein, it's looking good. The next step is the miniaturization of that device into a wearable system. And for that, we need a roadmap, not only for your product, but for the entire innovation that is coming to the medical devices, incorporating the biosensing photonics technology we have been developing in the EPIC network over the last two decades. So join the medical innovators on Monday, December 6. We look at how to accelerate the best ideas. We start the discussion at exactly 3 p.m. At 3 p.m., you are all here. You are all here, and I want you to, to get a little bit inspired 
how, how amazing 2021 was for the medical market in the Epic Network. It really has a huge growth. I tried to highlight there some of the examples. I, I already said that companies like Merck or Philips are very engaged with us. ST Microelectronics is helping them. 758 members of Epic are behind us. We keep growing, but it's not about the amount of members. It's about how much we know about them and how many events, how many connections, how many business opportunities we can enable. My name is Jose Pozo and together with Dr. Elena Veletkaya, we are chairing this meeting, but also speaking on behalf of 15 people who are committed. They commit their lives, their weekends, their evenings, their nights to the growth of photonic industry. Together we organize events. We help you raise capital. We have access to a huge network. We have the biggest website to find a job in photonics and we provide you with market reports. We are unfortunately by the end of the season five, what a season has been, only two more meetings. Write down the meeting on the 20th of December. We finish always the season with a Christmas food and beverage event. Write it down because we have really top companies in the segment. And for all of you, I can already announce the meetings after January. We are addressing some of the hot topics. And for the medical industry, we have a meeting on 31st of January on UV disinfection and in the end of April, medical optical fiber sensors. Write that down. That's going to be a spectacular meeting. As spectacular as today, 6th of December, San Nicolas, we talk about medical devices. This meeting will be possible with the support of our sponsors today, Aspherical, coming all the way from Jena, they provide Aspherical and Freeform Optics, Art Photonics, you're looking for charcoal and fiber, is your partner of choice, Chroma, one of the best suppliers worldwide of optical fil fil filters, Edmund Optics, the leading global supplier of optics, imaging, photonics technology since 1942 active, IMEC, the top R&D center coming from Leuven, providing microelectronics and manufacturing of optomechanical devices, addressing also the medical market, Modulite, coming all the way from Finland, semiconductor lasers, all the way from the MB growth to turnkey solutions to the clinicians. OFS is our partner for specialty optical fiber solutions, making great solutions for, for example, spectroscopy and FIX coming all the way from the Netherlands, from Enschede, provide services for the packaging and assembly of electronic devices and prospective. The company that we have in Epic providing high solutions for microscopy. And you're wondering, no, I didn't prepare any of that. I just get the logos and I get inspired, as inspired as my colleague, Dr. Elena Veletkaya. Elena, what's going to happen in the next two hours? Well, in the next two hours, we are going to have some extremely interesting discussions here because we will be going over different topics and uh, all of that is quite new coming up in uh, medical market. So we will be talking about single I use endoscopes, so we will talk about how you can see your veins without touching them to actually help to touch them more accurately or avoid them when needed. We will talk quite a bit about the uh, light therapies uh, or different possibilities of how to avoid the light, as well as the challenges and how to overcome the challenges of uh, production of medical devices when you're integrating new photonics technologies in there. And we have a few speakers, as you said, uh, uh, as we saw, but what is much more exciting, much more interesting is those people who are in a room together with us uh, through this meeting today. So we have uh, quite a number of medical system integrators coming together to see and discuss what are the challenges and how we can really address those challenges and overcome them, what you need to keep in mind from the very beginning and through the whole process. And we will also engage in the discussion of the supply chain, anywhere from optics, filters, coatings, uh, to uh, different photonic components, to lasers. And we also will engage with uh, R&D uh, providers, as well as those who do clinical evaluation. We also have people from photonic integrated circuits and uh, from sensing and sensors technologies. So we uh, even have uh, quite some people from market intelligence and consultancy. So as you can see, there are a lot of people in here. And I think if we come with an idea with this supply chain already, we can build any medical device we want and we can help it out to go through the whole process. But on the other hand, this ecosystem is really much bigger than that. So here it's only those who registered for this particular meeting. So I hope that for the next one, we will only keep growing in number of people who are ready to come and openly discuss the challenges, uh, what they're facing, but also their vision, their roadmap, and just come together to work on to making it happen.
And most important, we have you, Elena, the medical expert at Epic. This meeting is also live stream in YouTube. So all the YouTubers in the world, feel free to write down your question there in the YouTube chat if you want to get in touch with any of the participants today. All you have to do is write me an email, jose.pozo.epic-asac.com. I would love to make this introduction. I love connecting people. That's what I do for a living, connecting people. And today we are connecting with Patrick Ward Booth. He is the chairman of IQ Endoscopes. We all want to know about this market. We are very excited about optical endoscopes becoming disposable, but most important, we want to understand how the EPIC members can bring value to IQ Endoscopes. Patrick, thank you very much for being with us. The floor and the attention of the EPIC network goes to you. Hi. Wow, that was a bit of a build-up. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, I'm a clinician, so you guys who will move at the speed of light, you have to talk very slowly when you're talking to clinicians because they don't understand things as well as you do. So I'm here to learn, and, but I can also tell you a little bit of what we've been up to in prime and prime, uh, IQ endoscopes. I was an endoscopist. I also set up a number of uh, uh, endoscopy clinics, which moved endoscopy from the hospital to closer to the patient. So it was community-based endoscopy services. And I did that for a number of years. And that taught me what the issues were around endoscopy and what were the rate limiting steps. So I'm teamed up with a, an engineer from the automobile industry who had a lot of experience around materials and we formed IQ endoscopes. So why are we interested in endoscopy and why are we interested in single use endoscopes? I think you must look at that graph and you can see that this is an exponential growth in endoscopy because of all the factors I've laid up there about age and screening and the fact that gastroenterological diseases are the diseases of the world, it's not unique to the West. Um, it, it, it is a universal condition as people move to more Western diets, so the disease rates go up. And so uh, <clears throat> we decided that the, the, the rate limiting step based on my experience was the, the scope itself. And this is a true story that Andrew and myself, who was the other founder, we sat in a pub and we drew on the back of a beer mat what, we, what our vision was, this was five years ago. And we said, if we can make a single use endoscope for $100, we have a business. And five, six years later, we're making a single use endoscope for something approaching that. I give myself a margin of error because the pound collapses against the dollar. So that makes it easier for us. So there we are. We've got this huge ever exponential problem of uh, growth in, in GI diseases. And we have to come up with a solution for it, not just for those countries that can afford endoscopy, but for those who haven't even started on the world of endoscopy because it's just so expensive to deliver at the moment. So um, should end up with what we're trying to create. And as you know, clinicians are very small C conservative. So there's no point in creating a wonderful device which you think is fabulous, that they think is terrible. So our whole emphasis is to make it a me too device. It looks, it feels, it operates, it has the quality and all the characteristics you'd want out of a regular scope. However, if you're gonna have single use, you've gotta be able to see with it. It's gotta have image quality. And finally, you've gotta make it at a price which is cheaper than the guys are spending at the moment on their, on their decontamination processes. And even amongst all that is of course the other advantages, which is a sterile, as it says on our strap line, and it's safe because as you know, the, the decontamination process at the moment does not give you sterility. And there's a, a long record of, um, of cross infections and risks related to endoscopy. And finally, there's no way, way we can make a device which we aren't gonna manage at the end of it all. And we can't complete the project without finding a way to recycle, reuse re, uh, um, the, the materials that we make these devices out of. So that whole cycle, that circular economy, that circular process has got to be starting from one, will the clinicians use it, to two, will we manage it after we've finished with it? So that is the essence of what I'm doing. And this is what we're, where we've got to now in the process of getting accreditation for the first of the devices with a string of other devices to follow on, basing on a modular technology, which has crept in from the automobile industry, which Andrew has given us so much support on. So we end up, as we were instructed, with a wish list. Now, these are the things that are problems we've solved or we could solve better or we need help with. So we've come to you guys and said, this is what you need to do. This is where we need to learn from you guys. 
We know what the patients want. We know what the clinicians want. We need to work out how to deliver that. We're in the process of that. But if I come away from this meeting or several meetings thinking you guys have got some answers, I'm going to be on your emails before you can think. So that's my very brief presentation. What would you like to say? Thank you. First of all, thank you, thank you Patrick. So uh, let, let's take it from here. And I think we can be starting addressing your points one by one. I want to encourage everybody in the room. There is a, a chat box over here. So feel free to send your questions, comments in there or just uh, pop up your hand. And uh, we'll also be more than happy to hear you out uh, in the discussion. So before we go into discussion, Patrick, perhaps it will be also a little bit helpful if we could um, give a little bit more of a taste of what is in there in, in, in the single-use endoscope, what kind of makes it uh, different, what, um, what, what is in there, what do you need? So we have your Christmas list here, absolutely beautiful. So let's address that, but maybe first give us a little bit more of a feeling, what is actually inside of the endoscope? Sure, what sure. are we looking for? Sure. Uh, and I guess for, for those of you who are familiar with the, with the reusable scopes, you, you, you know the characteristics of an endoscope. It has to be able to, uh, it has to be flexible, it has to bend, it has to be driven by the endoscopist right around the large bowel, which is the hardest part, but also the upper bowel and, and, the, and the mid bowel. Uh, so it has to have all the characteristics that a regular scope would have. In other words, it has to be steerable, it has to be flexible, it has to have a degree of column strength and and torsional rigidity to enable the guide to undertake the maneuvers that are required for a, a complex, very subjective process, which is endoscopy. And this is one of the problems. This is why people have stayed away from this problem for quite a long time, because it is such a subjective process. And in all, so that delivers you the scope around the colon, but you have to also see where it's going. So you have to have high quality images and you have to be able to uh, put air into the stomach, into the gut, into the gut. You have to, be able to put water in there. You have to put you have to also be able to put a biopsy device in. And this is where an endoscope will score every time over a capsule, which can do those things, but it can't take a biopsy. So the guys would be taking biopsies at the very first the diagnostic procedure. But then as they get, as they get more uh, diagnostic issues resolved, then there's a therapeutic process. So following on behind that, you have to be able to do a number of therapeutic processes. And I'm sure you're, you're familiar with what goes on with the laparoscope. And uh, our ability, therefore, is, is to get more and more of a surgical procedure, especially in frail and elderly patients who would otherwise have to go to an open operation. So all the time, the, 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 the red line is being pushed and pushed so you, to, for you to do more and more. So what we have got in our scope is all the characteristics you get in a reusable scope. It will look, it will feel, and it will function like a reusable scope. And it does. OK. So. Um... Yeah, so we need some cameras, we need to have some considerations, but one of, one of the questions quite often coming up um, in principle is when you're developing a medical device, you really need to keep in mind as a clinician perspective. So for those companies who are developing the, the, the technology, so how could they make that exercise? Would you have maybe some sort of an advice and recipe there? Because now from, from you, yes, we can already get some specifications of a particular device, a particular components that needs to be integrated. But if, if, if I'm just trying to come up with a device, so what would you recommend? How to approach that in the first place? I think, uh, do you mean what, what is it that the clinicians are really looking for? Is that, is that what you're kind of asking? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So around those lines, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, yeah, I, th I think it, it's, it has to be functionality. The clinician wants functionality. He wants to be able to perform it. He's been trained for 10 years using a reusable endoscope. There's no way he's going to suddenly say, uh, actually, you, you've given me this device which operates in a different way. It has a keypad, for instance, or it has a joystick, whatever you think might be a clever way of doing it. Uh, it, it is, but then the clinicians have been trained to use the conventional endoscopy, which is uses these slightly cumbersome operating wheels, which are, 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 are difficult to get used to, to, to using. But once you've got them, this is how their, their, their muscle memory works. So they know how this works. So you, there's no point in changing the, the basic parameters that the clinicians used to use it. You have to accept this is what they want. Uh, and we will obviously try and nudge them in directions we want them to go. But just for a startup, we have to get market share with what people are used to. And where we will then say to them, because this is reusable, you don't have all the paraphernalia that goes with decontamination. 
So you can do the same procedure, but, but you don't need to do it in a large hospital endoscopy suite. You can do it in an outpatient clinic, or you can do it in a small health center. You can do it uh, pretty much any, in any environment so that you have to, you take them along that journey, you give them something they're used to using, and then you say to them, actually, do you need this $10 million endoscopy suite? No, you don't, you can do it in your office. So you gradually move the whole procedure to somewhere else. And if you take the, the really interesting area, which we haven't really touched on, but is fascinating. If you take developing world emerging markets where they can't afford endoscopy at all at the moment, they will have a blank canvas. So you will say, just as the telecoms industry went from no landlines to mobile phones to cell phones, and without anything in between, they went from nothing to cell phones. We anticipate that people will go from no endoscopy to single use mobile industry solutions. So it will be very transformative for, for huge areas of the world economy. Dr. Patrick Warbooth. Patrick, it's always great for us to make the link between the, the clinicians and the industry. And that's what we're going to do today. At Epic, we have a person who has actually helped us a lot making that connection. And one of your challenges today was to have very wavelength selection in the endoscopy solution. For me, an endoscopy is a camera and a fiber. I have a company here who manufactures the optical fiber ideal for endoscopy. It's Art Photonics in Berlin. Uh, Slava, Artyushchenko, Slava, thank you very much for being with us. When you see the Santa Claus Christmas wish list here of Aki Endoscopes, what resonates with you? What kind of cooperation can we start between you two? Mm. I should say a couple of things, um, uh, because I agree with Patrick that in general change from, let's say, expensive uh, endoscopes produced by Storz Olympus, what else, uh, to single use uh, endoscopes uh, is good idea. Uh, I saw uh, at Photonics West uh, 2020, um, uh, demonstration of uh, single use endoscopes from SHOT. Uh, they claim that it will be 500 bucks uh, of the endoscope. Um, uh, what, uh, I, I have two questions. One question to Patrick. Okay, how the market for endoscopy will be changed because of disposable uh, endoscopes? Because I heard the figure, I don't know if I should believe it, that it's about 20 billion market today for classic endoscopes. And if it will be changed for disposable, what will be changed? Uh, and then it will be my second question. Patrick, can you comment? Yes, I can. I think when you say, what is the market for endoscopy? That is the market for endoscopes that are actually sold. I think what you have to remember is the unmet need. And even in the West, the unmet need is significant. You could introduce a single use endoscope and get sizable market share and never go into an endoscopy room because there's so much unmet need outside the endoscopy rooms. Sure, there's centers of excellence where you're doing really complex therapeutics, where they've got to be using complicated, ex highly expensive reusable scopes. Uh, we're not interested in that, not at this stage. At this stage, we say, you guys carry on. You keep your endoscopy room running seven days a week, 12 hours a day. You'll, you'll still have plenty more left to do. And when you think, uh, and as obviously the, the COVID thing is obviously sort of brought everybody to everybody's attention. If you take a country like, a small area like Wales in the UK, they've almost got a whole year's work waiting to be done. And they, will, they can be done, they're, they're talking now of moving it out into a community setting. So that all that work will be done, a whole year's work will never go near a hospital. So that's why it's gonna work. When we're, it's a genuinely disruptive technology. We're not gonna be taking Olympus on tomorrow or Stoltz tomorrow. We're gonna do the unmet meet. And this is in just Western Europe. We're not talking, there's plenty of other places we could talk about, which is a, a story in itself. Um, so I, I, there's, there's no issue there um, around where, where are we going to start our, where are we going to start in the marketplace? <laughs> we're going to start in the, you know, it's like doing a jigsaw. You start at the bottom left-hand corner and you work your way up. And that's where we're going to go. And the, the volumes are eye-watering. Uh, how can we close the gap? That's the key question. How can we close the gap? How can I get something going between art photonics and IQ endoscopes? Um, um, get, get him to sign an NDA and I'll tell him all about ourselves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I will, uh, we shall not go in all details right now, but only one comment, you know, that in general, of course, what is going on in spectroscopy market 
uh, or optical biopsies, what else you know. That's why yeah. multispectral diagnostics, fluorescence, yeah. Yeah. near infrared, Raman, and so on, is really fast progressing. That's why I think what is limited for even disposable endoscopes, uh, that they are limited to the, let's say, visible range for our no. eyes. No. No, you're if not. not, then it's great because we are highly interested to be with you in this field. Yeah. And only one last comment, you know, unfortunately, up to now, there is no market of infrared endoscopes for mid-infrared. We really did excellent work uh, with Boston Scientific. 10 years, 66 millions invested, you know, and then it was full stop last February, not, right. not this year, year 2020. Why? Okay, maybe because of COVID, what else? Because um, single fiber, mid-infrared fiber can give you a chance to see something warm on the wall of esophagus or colon. Yeah. Because tumor, for example, is half a degree warmer and uh, sensitivity was about 0.1. We are highly interested to go in this field because then it will be easy, low cost diagnostics. Even when Boston Scientific decided to stop their investment, I think so it's not end of the world. Uh, let's try together. Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely interesting. And we're absolutely on that. I would say that the thing about single use endoscopes is maybe we're being a bit disingenuous because it's the endoscope that's single use but it has a base unit where all the brains is, where you can put your really complex stuff in and provided the, the, the delivery mechanism from the base unit to the tip is cheap, which we can do, then you can, there's a number of things you can do which exceed what you'll get with a reusable scope. So absolutely, we're on that one. Thank you very much, Slava. Like to to you. Okay. Sign that NDA, after. please, because you really need to connect. But one more thing, Patrick, in one of your Santa Claus Christmas list, you were looking for one a square millimeter cameras. Yeah. Uh, I think we take those kind of requests very seriously. Fabian from Opta Sensor, how can you help Patrick? Fabian, please unmute so we can hear you. Now, can so, you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so, um, thanks for the time. We are, uh, I, I work for Opta Sensor. Uh, we are a small company from Nuremberg, um, and we have a lot of years of experience in designing micro cameras. Um, we are offering uh, one micro camera called Ozidis M, um, which is not HD uh, resolution, like Patrick was, uh, was mentioning before, uh, but nevertheless is among the smallest devices on the market. And I just want um, all the audience here to be aware of our technology. And um, we, are, we are a small company, but with many years of experience in designing micro cameras for what is now uh, AMS AG. Uh, yep. So an Austrian company, which is yep. um, which acquired the um, uh, company um, uh, from... Uh, um, Simosis and uh, Awaiba. So we were pioneers uh, in designing that technology. And just for the panel here, uh, since we are talking to specialists to so be aware of uh, us and our offerings, uh, maybe in the future we can talk about uh, the details. You yeah, have we, to, we have Patrick, you need to play that camera. <laughs> It is, it is this all series thing made us really excited at Epic. Congratulations, Fabian, on what you are doing. Patrick, Thank one you, more Jose. thing. There is a company in, in Denmark specializing optical filters, and they have been working in many fields with medical companies. We have here in the room Paul Svensgaard from Delta Optical Thing Film. Paul, good afternoon. Hello, how are you? I am doing Hi. great. When I see you, I'm doing even greater. I, you had a very interesting comment in the chat. I want you to mm. voice it out, and maybe there is some room for cooperation here. Well, I'm just pointing out that uh, there, are, there is actually a, a Danish manufacturer of uh, endoscopes uh, who are, have introduced an, a, a range of single-use endoscopes for various applications, and they, I think they're introducing more. I mean, we're not directly involved with uh, delivering to them, but I'm just, uh, I was just made aware that, that these guys are already in that playing field. So I, I was curious to learn what, what is actually different from what they do, and, and what are the needs that can help us differentiate and bring this further out? That was sure. my, my question. That's sure, that's a good question. Interestingly enough, if you actually look at, at, at endoscopes, it's a gen, generic word really, but that 
it, it can be divided into 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 a, a, a GI type of endoscope, which is a multifunctional, relatively large device compared to the other sector, which is the smart catheters, I call them. And Ambu, who you're referring to, have sold a million single use bronchoscopes over the COVID crisis, because clearly that's a, been a real issue for, for respiratory issues around COVID. And so they've sold a million of them. A company in France called AVT has sold a huge number and Boston Scientific. These are essentially smart catheters. They only maybe move in one plane. They might have a biopsy channel, but they don't have a lot of the functionality you get with a gastroscope. And so the difference between us and Ambu is, is, is the functionality that, that or, and, but as you say, Ambu are coming to market next year with a uh, single use gastroscope. For us, it, it is what we call maybe being cynical. It's warming up the market for us. We find this stuff, we, can, we find that as no threat. Um, and I think you have a, we, you've kind of got an illusion to what other f functionality we can get into a single use scope. And we think we will end up with a, quite a lot of blue water between what they are producing and what we're producing. Um, but it, you're right, there's, there's room for everybody, but it is the market is going that way and it, and it is genuinely disruptive. Uh, I think that the bronchoscopy market will tail off because obviously less and less people are critically ill. And so there's less and less ITUs, respiratory failure patients, but it, it will settle down the, the bronchoscopy market, but it's still going to be significant. But bronchoscopy, cystoscopy, urology are something like 10% of the market compared to GI endoscopy. Okay. So it's a question of scale, it's a question of complexity, and it's a complexion. Horses for courses is the expression. I think if you want a, a, a catheter to get into something really tiny, then you need a smart catheter. If you're looking for the gut, we're going to do much more therapeutic stuff. You need a device that's got more functionality. So they're, they're the same, but they're not the same, if you understand me. Thank you very much, Patrick. You came to a meeting looking for challenges, looking for yeah. challenges, looking for ideas, looking for cooperations. I think we already scouted some of them. There are more people who are going to contact you now offline in the chat. But uh, before I go to the next speaker and I close the endoscopy chapter of this meeting, I have Ralph Stott from Carl Stortz in the room. Ralph, good afternoon. Ralph? Ralph, good afternoon. It's so great to see you. He's here in the room with us. Hello. I, I wanted Martin. for you to say hello before we go to the next point of the agenda, because when we talk about endoscopy, if we have Carl Storr in the room, you need to say hello. Uh, we had these challenges for IQ endoscopes looking for a, a, a small camera, cheapest flexible data transfer, wavelength selection, variable local length and magnification. IQ endoscope is clearly going for the disposable one-use only endoscopy. Uh, any of this resonates with you? Any ideas, any, any potential challenges on this list? Um, so I'm I'm from um, from research, so I'm not from the application, so I cannot say anything about all these medical things. Um, my I'm looking for um, the innovation in materials, in sustainable materials for such um, single-use endoscopes, because they generate a lot of waste, and and that's the reason why I'm looking here for for new materials, um, if there is something um, announced also here, uh, looking for sustainability. Which is a, a very big challenge, uh, Patrick. Yeah. It is yeah, a very I, big challenge. We are talking about optical endoscopes with active and passive components with uh, uh, fluoride, chalcogenide fiber. Uh, how do you address, how do we address this, Patrick? So, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. And if you look at the whole medical field, they're not addressing because it isn't just endoscopes that are single use, you know, but there's a huge amount of single use, even the PPE equipment that people wear. There's a mass, there's tons and tons of single use equipment in hospitals, all of which at the moment is just being forgotten about. So there's a whole industry in itself around sustainability. And it is going to be as big as the manufacturing industry because that, all this stuff has to be recaptured and, and recovered and repurposed and recycled. So it, it is a huge industry. And we are, like uh, uh, Ralph was saying, it, it is a major part of what we're going to, of our development program is, is recovering the device afterwards. 
what a way to start the meeting with having IQ endoscopes, call stores, and having the ad addressing new materials. So we address the recyclability and the problems with uh, materials that are perhaps scarce in one use only endoscopy. Let's continue, Patrick and, and Ralph and everyone. Thank you so much. Let's continue because the second presentation is equally exciting. We are going to image now the veins. We are going to do in vivo imaging with the chief scientist of AccuVein, Fred Wood. Fred, thank you very much for following up after the fantastic Patrick today. The floor and the attention of the EPIC network goes to AccuVein. You see wisely. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Frederick Wood. I'm the chief, chief scientist here at AccuVein. Let me, uh, let me share my presentation and get started. From the stars. Your background is yeah, amazing. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, uh, MEMS mirrors in medical devices. So, the Accuvane um, device is a combination laser camera, laser projector, and at the heart of it is um, the scan mirrors. And currently, we're using scan mirrors uh, from uh, ST Microsystems. Um, so I have uh, I have over thirty year, years experience in uh, in R and D. Um, I have a lot of patents that have to do with um, high speed laser scan mirrors and laser scanning re related technology. Uh, I invented the the Accuvane laser based uh, vein illumination device, uh, first prototyped in um, two thousand six. So our, our current device is, uh, is designed around the ST uh, MEMS mirrors and mirror driver chipset. Uh, we use, um, uh, we use an 80, 80, 80 hertz raster scan. We have an infrared laser and a green laser that are co coaxially aligned and focused uh, and scanned uh, using the uh, high speed and low speed scan mirrors. Uh, this enables device to capture an infrared image of the veins under the skin and simultaneously reproject a green contrast enhanced, enhanced image of the vein map right onto the skin to uh, help uh, nurses and phlebotomists start uh, IVs on the first try. So the advantages of laser scanning over camera projector-based vein illumination is uh, several features. So number one, we basically have an infinite depth of focus because we are using lasers that uh, are focused and collimated. So the uh, diameter of the laser spot uh, basically remains, uh, remains fixed, remains fixed enough for the working range of the device to enable uh, infinite depth of focus. Uh, this is what our uh, competitive devices, which are all camera projector based, they don't have. They don't have uh, uh, infinite focus. Uh, we have a high, highly efficient um, uh, laser light. So the all the uh, competitive uh, vein illumination devices don't use lasers and therefore they're not as efficient. Um, so we, we can have the smallest battery. We don't need a cooling fan because we're, we're so efficient. And uh, you know, cooling fan is something that you def definitely don't want in a uh, medical environment, uh, you know, COVID especially. Um, our scan engine is rugged and our lasers are permanently aligned. This is, this is really important in a, a vein imaging device because what you absolutely don't want is you don't want the input or the vision of the device to be misaligned with the output of the device because that would be you know worse than helpful for the device to be showing you where a vein is and, and, and it's not actually in the right location, it's not aligned. Uh, camera projector bases, based vein illuminations devices um, suffer from the fact that the, the imaging device and the projection device are completely separate and they're, they're quite different. They're different in resolutions, they're different in field of view, 
and they're they're physically separated so uh the alignment you know the, for a, a bump or a drop uh can cause the device to become misaligned and um this is something that the Accuvane device definitely does not suffer from because our lasers are permanently aligned. Uh, and finally, uh, one of the big advantages of, uh, of our laser scanning uh, for imaging and for projection is that uh, technically it's one device, it's one scan engine that does the imaging and the projection. So all of our so our input and output pixels are identical and allows us to have the fastest processing time. Uh, again, we're we are um, uh, uh, imaging at uh, 80 hertz frame rate and we're actually processing at the same rate. So 180th of a second, we process the entire image. We use, uh, we use the ST uh, MEMS mirrors and we uh, mount them and wire bond them on flexes so they can be uh, handled uh, by hand uh, in the factory where they're assembled into the scan engine. Um, and the advantages of the ST MEMS mirrors in this case are, you know, small size, small enough certainly for our, our application. Uh, they're rugged. Um, which is, you know, a, a big advantage over our prior uh, scan mirrors uh, that we used in our, our previous device. Um, they have extremely low power consumption and uh, reliable position sensing uh, built into the built into these mirrors is uh, very important for application. Uh, and we have a uh, we have a, a scan engine that has um, two lasers in it. Uh, near infrared at running at uh, 830 nanometers and uh, a green laser uh, 520. And we use um, uh, a dichroic mirror to combine these two lasers into one uh, collinear uh, combined laser beam and uh, uh, bounce them off of the high speed and low speed scan mirrors to create our projection, which again is also our imaging method. So let me stop sharing. So there are several advantages of uh, a laser camera for medical imaging. Uh, I'll start with telling you what a laser camera is not good at. A laser camera is not good at taking pretty pictures. Um, but you know, medical imaging is 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 not about pretty pictures. And the reason I mention that is that, of course, laser camera is blind to ambient light. It's blind to room lighting. Uh, and it's also blind to the interference of room lighting because laser camera only sees what the uh, laser uh, is uh, scanning across. So, uh, so that's what uh, laser camera is not good at and what is good at. Now, Here's one of the really big advantages of, of a laser camera is the fact that we can have a really large light collection area. So great for things that are really hard to see. Um, you know, a, a, a camera, if you have a really good camera with a really big lens, the trade-off is you have a really tiny depth of focus because that's, you know, that's how it works. You know, I, I you know, uh, Cell phone cameras have a, a very tiny aperture, so they they have a, a better depth of focus, but they have a tiny light collection area. So that's great for a well lit scene or or an artificially lit scene. You can use a camera with a small aperture because you don't need to fight to collect a lot of light. When you're doing medical imaging and you're trying to see things that are hard to see, you really want to have a large collection area. So uh, we can have both a very large collection, light collection area, and uh, depth and very large depth of focus. Technically, uh, practically infinite depth of focus at the same time. So that's a real advantage for uh, medical imaging to have that. Um, so, so the 
So th that's a good thing to have. And then uh, again, you know, the laser camera, the combination laser camera, laser projector, laser projector is really uh, purpose built for reprojection for um, uh, uh, virtual, uh, virtual reality uh, yes. because Sorry, yes. one question sure. uh, qu just quickly here uh, as we are already talking about some advantages of uh, laser camera and just before we were talking about advantages of uh, single use endoscopes can we combine those two advantages together will there be some multiplication of uh, using one with another or is there in general something on your roadmap of developing as a next step for Aquavain? we have looked into we have looked into endoscopes and in fact we have uh, we have some patent coverage there the thing the thing that i would see is that the size is a problem you know getting getting into a truly small size let's remember that you know for uh, for for laser scanning you need to have uh, scan mirrors to create a raster scan and to get scan mirrors into a truly small size uh, is, uh, is is probably more of a challenge uh, than you know can be overcome in, in that case like if we are not going into um, miniaturization of, uh, of the device, what are other possible applications of that? Because it is pretty obvious uh, at the moment, uh, it is used to uh, yeah, not to puncture uh, the uh, wrong spot. So to, uh, for the nurses to actually hit the vein uh, as good as possible. Also prior the meeting uh, in, a, in, in a more private setting, we also had a discussion a little bit where you commented on uh, applications in beauty. So uh, what other applications are uh, possible out there? Okay, so there, there's a lot, there's a lot, and the you know where it, where the laser camera really shines, uh, pardon the pun, is in you know reasonably close range, and I mean that by you know less than, you know, less than half a meter away um, range, uh, that that's where it really works well. But you know that's that's basically fine for for medical imaging, and let me describe an application. Um, we have, we have some patent coverage and we have a working prototype of a device uh, that would be used for uh, looking at uh, ICG. Uh, so uh, ICG or endocyanin green is a chemical that has been around for decades, it's FDA approved. It's a chemical that's injected into the bloodstream and it fluoresces if, if you excite it with um, with the proper wavelength of uh, near infrared light, it glows and it glows also in the infrared range. So it's not human visible. Mm -hmm. So we made a device. So we made a device with a huge collection area, huge meaning you know several square inches of collection area, and uh, this device can see the ICG um, very well and can reproject uh, green laser light onto the locations where it sees, uh, sees the ICG. So it's great, for, um, it's great for visualizing perfusion. Um, you know, there, there certainly are devices on the market that are used uh, in, in hospitals for visualizing ICG, the problem is that these devices, uh, the devices on the market, you have to look away from the patient to see, for example, to see perfusion. Um, so our technology can not, not only see the ICG chemical with much more sensitivity than a camera, but we can actually reproject visible light uh, onto the areas to basically show where the where the perfusion is, show where the ICG chemical is. Okay. Well, here's, where, here's where it gets really interesting: is that ICG can have uh, cancer detecting um, uh, uh, compounds added to it. So you can inject ICG into a patient; it will flow into the bloodstream. Bloodstream. And ICG will be attracted to 
the, the cancer. So imagine you're doing uh, cancer surgery and you're trying to cut, you're trying to remove cancerous tissue. The doctor can actually see where the cancer is in order to uh, remove it because the, uh, because the you know, uh, cancer detection is basically highlighted. Um, so, okay. so that's where it gets that's, really interesting. That's really, no, it, it, it gets very interesting. And even without ICG, if you can highlight really the small veins, then it's also quite known that cancer has different structure of veins. So perhaps even without extra compounds, uh, we could go and try to see cancer. But I do see that we have some questions in the audience. So I do want to give uh, Tracy... Tracy Vanek, uh, the opportunity also to ask her a question. Tracy? Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Elena. Dear Dr. Woods, this is fa uh, fantastic. I wanted to ask you if this could be applied to uh, imaging deep vein thrombosis uh, for leg veins, uh, and could it also be simultaneously with ablation? Okay, so the problem is when you're shining a light through human tissue, you have lots of diffusion. So the deeper, the deeper you shine the laser into the tissue, it, the, the light basically spreads, yeah. spreads yeah. out. So you very quickly find a situation where, um, you know, you have difficulty, you have difficulty mm -hmm. seeing. Now, let me, let me provide a counter argument. And the counter argument is when ICG is used mm -hmm. because, uh, because the, because the ICG is fluorescing, you can detect the ICG really, you know, really quite deep into the tissue because of the, because of the extreme sensitivity that, for example, conventional cameras don't have. Okay, okay thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, you mentioned a couple of times in your presentation, and I really want to come to that because we really love success stories, especially when they involve our members like um, ST Microelectronics. And we have Ellen here. Um, and uh, you mentioned that uh, you did uh, use ST Microelectronics MEMS in there. So, Ellen, I would like to um, ask you also to give a couple of comments and maybe a few words about STM. Sure, of course. Thank you, Elena. And thank you, uh, Fred, for a wonderful presentation and a great device. Um, the uh, ST Microelectronics MEMS mirrors uh, is actually um, a, a complete system and chipset offering that we do. Um, the one that is being used by Acuvin that was shown over here is the, our current and existing one that is in mass production. Those are a set of two, uh, mi two micro mirrors. One is a fast scanner moving in resonant mode, and another one is a slow scanner uh, moving in a linear or quasi-static mode. Then there is also an ASIC or a system on chip, which is uh, basically for that a specific application is the uh, micro mirror controller. Then to complement that, we also have a very fastly modulated uh, with great rise and fall time uh, of an LDD uh, that can toggle you know, uh, lasers in a very uh, uh, fast and accurate way. The uh, evolution of those micromirrors that are being used today by Acuvin, uh, those are electrostatic micromirrors. And today in 2022, uh, we will be announcing a new family of uh, micromirrors, uh, which are going to be using a, a different actuation technology, which is based on piezoelectric material. And the main advantage there would be uh, twofold. Number one, greater force. So min miniaturization of the micromirrors would be possible because we, on a smaller space or smaller material of actuator, we will be able to use greater mass. Number two, and the biggest, I think, advantage, especially also for those mobile devices that are battery operated, those uh, piezo devices are driven by an, a very smart energy recovery uh, ASIC driver that we have that is about one-tenth of uh, the power consumption in comparison to the older electrostatic-based uh, micromirrors. The uh, application are so wide for micromirrors and or for MEMS actuators, and it, you can find them really in different uh, photonics-based uh, applications, whether if it's a small display engine or RGB for augmented reality application for smart glasses, uh, what was the uh, uh, used to be called uh, once uh, pico projectors to be able to design a very tiny on a keychain even a pico projector 
and, the, and just, you know, something that crossed my mind because I saw the uh, lecture before uh, on uh, the endoscopy of IQ endoscopes and something I already sent you an email about that uh, is a company in, in Norway called Polite that are using tiny MEMS actuators to move membranes in order to be able to get to a very, very small a focusing element for uh, camera phones, for camera uh, cameras that goes into uh, watches, etc. So the magnitude of applications for MEMS actuators and micromirrors is really fast, and I really enjoyed to see uh, Fred's presentation today, how they well use that uh, for a very nice device. You didn't enjoy it half as much as I as I did. It was really truly really fascinating, Fred. When I see your uh, when I see your amazing device which we are already in love with. I see challenges for the laser and challenges for the optics. The Epic Network, because that's the reason for this, for this meeting. Uh, so, Sorry for that. So I think we have some connectivity problems so that you can you can hear me and see me. Fred, uh, I would like to come to you with some of the partners that we have in the EPIC network. Coming all the way from Belgium, I have a company called Lambda X, who specializes in system integration on microscopy and camera systems. Didier Benjuin, thank you very much for being with us today. Tell us, what's on your mind? Hello, everybody. Um, so about... Uh... Microsystems, yes, we, we, um, we integrate uh, um, optical system in the company for, the, for uh, people who, like some of you, uh, likes to bring new product to the markets and who suffers of lack of uh, engineering or lack of uh, uh, knowledge to do this. So we offer services here in the company to build whatever, medical devices. Uh, we built a lot of microscopy system in the past. And we are also doing some uh, uh, contract manufacturing for some of, of those customers. So those are services we offer a, in the company. Specifically for micro mirrors, I was also interested in there because we have customers trying to use uh, this type of devices to project uh, elements on a, on a wall. And so I was uh, sending, I uh, thank you for the, for the website <laughs> request to Elan Hot for this uh, on, the, on the chat. So basically, we, we can uh, address many of, of the, the engineering aspects that, uh, that you, you may have as a need for, for your applications, but we are open to any kind of applications. If I can get two nice people like you to working together, I would call it a fantastic, a fantastic meeting. Fred. Uh, following the presentation from Patrick, he had one slide about his Santa Claus Christmas list. If you could dream away of what would be your ideal components or, your, or the components that can solve your challenges in terms of beam shaping and the ideal laser. So, um, so I would say the only thing on our list uh, really would be uh, money. So, <laughs> and, and the reason is because, you know, the laser scanning technology that we're use, utilizing is, is really quite simple. And therefore our, our challenges are, are low and, you know, uh, you know, boil down to really, you know, uh, uh, investment, you know, we're, we are, uh, you know, we are busy um, with our current product, uh, you know, the good news is that our product is selling so well that we can't make them fast enough. The bad news is that we can't make them fast enough, uh, especially in the, the current, you know, COVID supply chain uh, problem. So, um, which, yeah, I mean, you know, the supply chain is absolutely, is absolutely a problem, but, you know, in terms of, you know, in terms of branching out into, uh, other devices, our challenges are really less about the engineering and more about the fact that we, you know, don't don't have the cash for a you know multi-year, multi-million dollar um, uh, investment right now in something that would require uh, you know FDA approval. Um, so that's you know th that's where we're at. 
Fred, uh, when you tell me that your biggest challenge is money, money is never a challenge when you have a great idea and you do have a great idea. However, I'm going to introduce you to some companies who I think can help you further reduce the uh, power consumption on the laser because I still believe that you didn't shout that out loud, but I do believe that reducing that would actually improve uh, even further, even beyond the stars where you already are. Fred. Thank you so much and congratulations on what you are doing in the industry. And we love, we like now to welcome another success of the Epic Network. We are going to go to one Epic member who joined Epic already quite a long time ago, five years. And we have seen in those five years a company flourishing, addressing some of the key companies in the market of augmented reality. I'm talking, of course, of the company Inoftech. And I have the founder and CEO, Ralph Noll, to take the floor now, take the floor now and illuminate us and make us see clearer Inoftech. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for being epic. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Jose. Um, good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for having me on. Let me share my screen. Um, we can see crystal clear. Let's go uh, slideshow mode, presentation mode. So we can see those diamonds shining the way they should. Is it? Is it not in? in full mode now. It is now, yes, we can it go. Is. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Um, again, um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ralph Noll. I'm representing in Optech. I'm the founder and CEO. And today, I would like to speak about how in Optech can avoid painful light trigger migraine attacks or harmful light exposure after eye surgery. Um, some of you might know in Optic already, we are active in various areas like uh, AR, um, outdoor sports, automotive. So our glasses can tackle various um, problems in the field of rapid adaptation. So if you run into a dark tunnel, um, you can see instantly stuff like this. But today, since the topic is medical devices, I will speak about health tech. And as you see from the number of components, we are using eight photosensors, two per, uh, four per eye, uh, uh, LC shutters, photosensors, eye trackers, LED. It's a very complex and uh, sophisticated pair of um, glasses. Um, so, Again, today I will speak about light sensitivity as a permanent condition or after uh, eye surgery. And the numbers are pretty big, you won't believe it, but five to 20% of the population suffer under light sensitivity. Um, I hope this GIF is running. If not, I will explain it um, here with the text. On the left side, you see regular sunglasses. And as you know, they have a fixed light absorption. So any change in the ambient light will be basically transmitted to the light at the eye one-to-one, -one, just attenuated. And in our case here on the right side, you see the in optic smart glasses, they have a dynamic light absorption, which means any change in the ambient light will not be transmitted, it will cancel out to the uh, uh, light at the eye. So in other words, here in red, uh, the light at the eye is always constant, it will not change. Um, sorry about the, the GIF animation, if you want to have a look at it, you, you go to investors.inoptech.com, there it is running. Um, here, um, the same effect in the different graph, you see that the outer light is changing. It goes from 4,000 lux down to 400, and then it goes up again. But here the flat line, the orange line, indicates that there is no change. And if there's a change, it will be far lower than one lux, and you can adjust this point through a mobile app. So if you want to have 400 lux constant at your eye, no matter where you are looking at, you can actually set this point. So here we say it's a, it's a medical fixation for the human iris. Well, I'm not a doctor, but, but having said this, I, I think 
the the medical people um, in the audience, um, their their imagination um, is going to start right now. If you think about a medical fixation for the human iris, so we can actually set the diameter of the iris through the mobile app, and this is um, really new. We are uh, worldwide the first company um, who is doing this. So um, very briefly, um, there are different um, glasses in the market. Some of you might say, well, I've seen sunglasses, they, they change the tint, but believe me, it's not true. Some have only two discrete levels. They work like welding shields. They suddenly jump between two states. We do not do this. Our system is continuous. So it's a very smooth, seamless process but still in real time, you see here one millisecond and our other, well, it's not really competitors, but other technologies uh, are in the realm of one minute or 100 milliseconds. So we have really outstanding technology here. So now I come uh, to the main topic. Um, we are a startup. We are entering uh, the market very soon. Um, we have B2B, uh, B2C markets uh, in our focus and also um, B2B for um, post-eye surgery. Um, here I prepared a little list. I don't want to go through the whole list, but you can see I divided the list in two sections. B2C is more for the end user. B2B is more for the big host uh, hospitals and the health insurance companies. So I, I give you um, an example here. Um, after a LASIK, you're very light sensitive. You might want to wear... Um, um, sunglasses, and I will explain in a minute why sunglasses do not work. <laughs> I come to this. Uh, the same is after cataract operation, um, you need an intraocular uh, lens implant. After this operation, you are suddenly super light sensitive, and these people need also protection. And again, um, sunglasses have their limits because they have only a constant attenuation. And um, again, I will come to this. Also, um, the age-related uh, macular uh, degeneration is, is a problem. People need um, limited light and, and many other um, issues. I don't want to explain everything. Um, but let me start um, with something where a startup like in Optech can earn a lot of money because as a startup, we are um, obliged to deliver and make our shareholders happy. And here is, unfortunately, I must say, uh, migraine, a big topic. So let me um, explain a little bit about migraine. Um, here is a fact sheet. 5% um, of the world population have migraine. Um, migraine is not healable. This is very important. You have to remember this. It's genetically inherited. And 65% um, of these people get migraine attacks triggered by light. So if I multiply the 5% with the 65%, I'm now talking about 3% of the world population. And this is really a huge market. Um, the good news is um, since, well, good news for us, bad news for the migraine patient, of course. But what I mean here is um, since it is not healable, um, it is just a personal protection equipment so we do not need FDA approval, but we can help migraine patients to avoid more pain. They do not have to take opioids uh, anymore. And even if they have a migraine attack already, they can wear the glasses um, also during the migraine attack. Usually it's for preventing the migraine attack, but let's assume it's already there. Then they can um, wear these glasses also. Um, so currently they're using four different sunglasses with different tints. So they basically adjust manually by changing these glasses and in between they close their eyes. So it's a really you know, annoying and dangerous process when they change different sunglasses. And we will deliver an all-in-one uh, solution, just one sunglass and they can keep their eyes open. And we deliver this for the same price plus X is a premium for um, the, the, the advantage they have. So here is a comparison between a sunglass and our system. On the left side, you see two curves here where my mouse is. And you see it's just a shift in the curve because the constant attenuation means 
that um, the light at the eye is just um, shifted to the lower part. But then again, if you exceed the migraine trigger here, the red dot, um, then in the lower part, you see the migraine gets triggered. And um, this is now really interesting. Most people of you might do not know this. If the trigger is over, this is here, the red dot um, on the right, then you might think, oh, okay, then the migraine attack is over. But unfortunately, this is not true because migraine works in a self-reinforcing cycle. So it's like a vicious cycle. It gets worse and worse and worse. And then you're four days out of order. You have to hide yourself in a dark room. And it's a big issue. Um, the, the employer is unhappy and the person, of course, as well. And here on the right side, you, you see the difference. The orange line is suddenly a flat line. And this is a big difference. So here in green, I'm saying margin of safety that delivers the protection. And therefore we can literally guarantee that nobody gets a light triggered migraine attack anymore. So in other words, we um, ensure that the light level is always below the migraine trigger level. So there's a lot of uh, safety margin in between and we ensure this um, safety margin. So this is our latest design. We have also printed it out. Um, so it comes in different colors, sizes, and so on. This is not a, a ready product, but, but the first um, example. We have showcased that the technology works on various shows internationally. Um, people were impressed. And as I said, we are a startup. We have also a little Christmas wish list. Um, this is my last slide. Um, we are ready now to modulate uh, the intensity. Um, I, I call this slide here the six uh, degrees of freedom in the field of vision and smart glasses. So point number one is done. Um, point number two, modulate light contrast via LEDs is also done. Um, now we are looking for providers for um, electrochromic um, plastic films to change the color a little bit between red and green. It's a very slow process. It's one second. Um, the next project we are on, we, we need to auto rotate the polarization because if you turn your screen by 90 degrees, you, you might have a problem if you use linear polarizers. This is something we are working on. Um, the last two points are not so important right now, but um, if there's anybody, then I'm, I'm happy to talk about high-speed shutters and autofocus um, lenses. The last thing here on this slide is a bi-directional <laughs> Christmas present. So if somebody wants to become a, a co-owner, um, then we offer a tenfold um, back uh, in seven to 10 years, and we have a 20% liquidation preference per annum. You can check out our website. It's called investors.com inoptech.com. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, and yeah, this is where we are. And again, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you all for your presentation and uh, yeah, addressing such a big uh... Uh, such a big problem. Luckily, I'm not one of those uh, percentages of people who get migraines, at least uh, not yet. Hope it doesn't really develop with time. But uh, yeah, you already addressed a little bit your Christmas wish list. But uh, nevertheless, coming back to a point where you mentioned yourself at the beginning that um, within the glasses you have uh, over 20 different photonic components. So if, if you would boil it down a little bit on what sort of components you are actually looking at, who would you like to talk like from the room? Because we have a lot of components. We have a lot of people in the room. So what, what is the main challenge? What's something which doesn't let you quite sleep well at night and you still need to fix in your glasses? Yeah. Um, well, of course, we have identified already uh, main suppliers. But uh, honestly, it's always good to have a second source. So... Currently, we are using the Osram True Eye Sensor, which is sensitive like the human eye. So we cover all the uh, spectral um, sensitivity of the eye. The, the eye is uh, typically very sensitive in the green area. And this is done by a so-called True Eye Sensor. It, it's almost like the eye. And we look for a second source. 
Um, the same is true for um, liquid crystal shutters. There's uh, Toshiba, Panasonic, etc. So um, anybody who can uh, supply super fast shutters, it, it's always interesting. Uh, thirdly, our eye sensor um, has a, a field of view of, of 30 degrees and we have to narrow it down. So maybe a micro lens provider, but, but very cheap micro lenses would be interesting. And last but not least, this is more organic material, I believe, or plastic. It's, it's a redox um, um, reaction. It's called electrochromic effect. Um, you apply voltage and then within a second, it's not super fast, but fast enough for us. It will slightly change the color. So this is the, the four points I, I like to mention. Okay, well, I'm sure there will be quite a lot of people coming to you now or later after the meeting, but I'm curious to ask you something more. Since we are talking practically about digital glasses over here, and uh, yes, you are looking into the whole range of uh, wavelengths, which are uh, our eyes are sensitive to, but uh, on the other hand, when we come more to the dark side of the spectrum, uh, the eye becomes less sensitive to that. So do you also augment that part into actually making your glasses helping people to see in the dark? Is it also an element of this digital solution or it's not there yet or it's completely out of the scope? Um, no, this is a good question. It's, it's actually part of our system. This is the reason why we call it a system, not that just glasses or goggles. Um, we do have LEDs. Um, these could be RGB LEDs. And if you, for example, would like to have um, a more crisp bluish light, we can synchronize the glasses on the blue channel of this RGB LED. Whilst all the bystanders have this old fashioned uh, 4000 Kelvin soft light. So we have different light channels so that we can distinguish um, between the colors. So I can give you a bespoke color or I can even put you into a kind of cocon. It's like the anti-noise of light. So if you want mm -hmm. to read your book in peace whilst uh, uh, sitting in a train and outside, you know, it's flickering because the sun is behind the trees, then um, we can create your own environment. As I said, it's like the Bose out, uh, anti sound, which you see all, always on the trains and in the planes. And this is something we also create with our LEDs. We can provide this uh, cocoon style um, environment for you if you are a hypersensitive person, a migraine uh, person, and so on. Yeah, and uh, one more question from really practical point of view, because once again, there are so many different components uh, in, in the system, and it's really a system, but at the same time, we're talking about the patients or people in general using them and, and, and wearing them, not just on a daily basis, but through the whole day. So what is the weight of it? What is the weight of the system? And do you look maybe for some more components to miniaturize and make it, or different materials even to make it even lighter? Yeah, very good question. The, 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 the good news is that the electronic parts are really lightweight. So um, the heaviest parts are the lenses itself and the plastic. So currently we are looking at uh, 60 grams, but um, I believe we can go to, down to 40 grams in the future um, by making it more light, uh, lighter, everything lighter. But um, you need to keep in mind that um, the temples at the side here, I, I showcased this, um, they need to be wide in order to be light tight. Um, and, and this is, uh, I mean, there are two sides of the same metal. On the one hand, we can make it very fashionable. You, you might know it from brands like Versace, Dolce Gabbana. They have these white temples, right? So we can combine fashion and technology. So for us, it is not the utmost goal to make everything super small and super light because of course, migraine patients will wear it during the whole day. But then again, we have motorcyclists, skiers, mountain bikers, and they wear it only when they are in action. And for them, 60 grams is, is perfect. So the only question which remains, how light will it be for the migraine patient? And we are working on this to, to go down from 60 grams to 40 grams. Okay, now that's, that's really great. Thank you so much. And now I would like to...
I will move to a question now you do have here in the audience David right. go ahead can you hear me is that okay yes yeah. loud and clear yeah. I found it very interesting, uh, Ralph, there, the integration of the blue LED, because in the blue LED activities, in a second here, in the blue LED, we, we have an awful lot of anti-depression um, uh, editing that we do for other, um, for other sort of applications. So for example, in some animal breeding applications, they have blue LEDs integrated into a headset mm -hmm. because if their mood is not elevated, they won't, uh, since in terms of horse racing, they won't actually breed. But I think there is a real strong secondary market. If you're able to integrate blue LEDs into these devices sustainably, not just for what you're doing, because a lot of individuals suffer from cold, uh, cold medical conditions, which is one of them is, which is people have suffered very badly from migraines, but also a lot of the individuals get migraines resulting from emotional conditions. So I think actually you have a real secondary market there and people with uh, um, depression and other, other alternatives like that. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot for, for your comment. I, I totally agree. And um, by the way, this is actually what I meant with the photochromic foils. Um, the, the, main, the main point is actually to lower the intensity. Um, there's a whole industry of lens makers like Hoya, OptiSwiss, etc. And they put coatings on lenses. But um, honestly, they do it also for marketing reasons, because it sounds good if you can advertise, well, this is good for car driving because we are taking out the blue light, etc. cetera. But um, honestly, what the biggest problem is, is not the color, it's not the chroma, it's actually the intensity. And this is our core competence. So we are, have, have this varying intensity. And then on the same mobile app, as you said, we could say, push it a little bit more towards the blue. <clears throat> this is a passive filter. It's not an active filter in terms of um, modulating and demodulating light as I explained it earlier. Um, so it's basically a colored filter with a changeable color and you can change the colors through the mobile app. And what you said <clears throat> is already part of our program. We have an LED ring, it's not, not here on the glass. So it sits on top over a kind of rim um, there are RGB LEDs, which shine white light. So we don't want to disturb anybody, you know, like our partner who's sitting opposite or who, anybody else. So towards third party, we stay always neutral also because we have to fulfill certain regulations and standards like TÜV, et cetera. So we shine always neutral white light or 400K light, very warm light. Nobody's irritated, but internally, I'm speaking about what you see as a wearer, we can synchronize the glasses on the blue channel of an RGB stream, and then you have your blue light you just mentioned. <clears throat> so this is a little bit um, a, a trick. It's called time domain multiplexing. So we slice the light like a salami, and then you pick the time slot you wanna see, if you see what I mean. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now let's move from avoiding light into actually using it to, to the advantage. So we will be moving now to our next speaker, Sara Valencia from uh, Swift Success, uh, Biotron. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Sara. And uh, let's see what are the challenges within light therapy technologies, but also to know first what light therapy actually can do for us. So now the attention of everybody goes to you. Your presentation is already up. So, so thank you very much to invite me. I just uh, first I will apologize for my voice. I am quite sick, so perhaps I will be coughing, so I just apologize for that. I will do my best. Uh, in a way, this is not too much disturbing. Um, so I am uh, Sara Valencia Garcia. I'm a medical advisor of uh, Bioptron. Um, Bioptron is a company uh, located in close to Zurich in Switzerland. So it uh, takes part of a bigger company named uh, Septel International, which provides a lot of products related to health uh, for everyone. And Bioptron takes part of the medical branch. So Bioptron takes part of the Septel group since uh, 1966. And we are present in more than 60 countries through our offices or through some distributors. <laughs> really sorry, it's not COVID, I promise. 
So uh, Biotron, uh, it's a company, the main product, it's a Biotron hyperlight devices. So those are uh, phototherapy uh, devices, which the aim is to heal and to help the body with the re reparative processes. We have the same technology for three different devices. In a way we can adapt in the best way to the needs of each patient. So we have three models. One of them is Medol with five centimeters uh, diameter. In a way people can be use it at home to treat small areas and even bring it um, uh, when they are traveling or going on holidays. In a way they can treat themselves even in, in that moment. Bipro one, <coughs> sorry, with 11 centimeters that can be used in clinical, in clinics and hospitals, but also can be used at home for people that needs to treat bigger uh, areas. And we have Biotron 2 or B2 that it's intended for the use in hospitals and clinics because the area of treatment is uh, 15 centimeters. So as I told you, we have three devices, but the technology is the same. And this is what I will explain you now, which are these characteristics of the light with these healing properties. So first of all, it's a uh, biotron light is polychromatic. This means that it contains since 350 nanometers until 3,400 nanometers, meaning that it's since blue light, all the visible spectrum and a little part of the near infrared. In a way, this can uh, attempt different layers of the skin and interact with different chromophores that we have in our tissues. And of course, very important, it does not contain UV. So we avoid all these negative and side effects that could have this UV light. Biotron light is also incoherent. This means that each wavelength, it's, it's a wave of light is following their own way. So it's non-invasive, it's very safe, and we allow this effective healing process. Biotron light is low energy, so it's providing a 40 millibats per centimeter square per, uh, per minute as uh, density energy. This energy will allow to trigger different cellular mechanisms that we will see later without creating inhibition, photo inhibition. And finally, biotron light is polarized, vertical and circular, because thanks to the uh, fuller molecule contained in the filter. <coughs> The polarization is very important because this will allow an optical penetration, an optimal penetration, sorry, in the tissues. And all these characteristics together is that will allow what we call biostimulation. These biostimulation are the uh, processes that are triggered by biotron devices. So I will not enter too much in details because we don't have the time, but we have extended uh, bibliography that proves that these biostimulative effects of biotron are uh, very precise and can help in different medical indications. As you can see here, biotron will improve the microcirculation by vasodilatation, the little capillaries, but also improving the angiogenesis, very important in wound healing as we will see. It reinforces the immune system. It stimulates regenerative and reparative processes. It promotes wound healing and it relieves the pain or decreases the intensity. These biostimulative effects are common, for example, when you have low back pain or you have a burn or you have a viral uh, infection or you uh, have an ankle sprain. You will need, in any case, to improve the microcirculation, also to decrease the, pain, the ischemic pain. <coughs> You will, of course, need to reinforce the immune system also to decrease the inflammation, especially in the case of burns, you will need to stimulate this regenerative process and wound healing, and of course, relieve the pain in any case is very important. How to achieve this result? It's a very easy to use since biotron devices are intended to be used by private customers, but also in professional use. You can use it for 10 minutes, at a distance of 10 centimeters from the region that you would like to treat once or twice a day for as long as needed. And this is very important that Biotron is compatible with other treatments, meaning that if you need to treat a burn, you can use Biotron taking part of the whole treatment for the burns, for example. For these reasons, Biotron uh, is medically certified in Europe and for pain relief uh, in, in United States and in Canada, and it can be used by private and professional people. Biotron is medically certified for wound healing, as we will see with different types of wounds, 
for pain treatment in different domains because pain is a very large uh, topic with different reasons. So for chronic pain, but also for acute pain, for some de dermatological disorders, and it's uh, medically certified also uh, to be used in children and in uh, newborns for specific pathologies. And finally, Biopjol is medically certified also for seasonal affective disorder or the winter depression. I don't have the time to enter in, in the whole details, but <coughs> so Biotron is in the market for more than 30 years. So we have an extended uh, bibliography, which explains which are the cellular mechanisms that are specifically triggered to Biotron to achieve these results. On top of that, of course, we have multiple cases. I just present you some of them today here. Biotron is very useful in the treatment of chronic wounds, as you can see here, elderly people, people that cannot move so much, that have open wounds even for years. You can see here that in less than one month, this wound that any professional arrived to close was closed thanks to the use of Biotron and completely compatible with the health um, situation of these people with neurodegenerative disorders and other uh, health problems. Biotron has excellent results also in diabetic food. We are in a society in which, uh, unfortunately, diabetes is increasing the number of patients. And uh, these people have, are very prone to develop some uh, wounds, very complicated to, to close. Biotron is very helpful also in these cases without side effects and perfectly compatible with other treatments. <coughs> Biotron can help also, as I told you, in dermatological diseases, as in the case, for example, in acne. You can see here a case in which this lady was using antibiotics for months without any success. She started to use Biotron, and you can see how in less than one month, the um, acne was healed. It was not anymore developed, and the skin was regenerated. And uh, finally, another example that I can show you today is uh, in psoriasis. It's a um, chronic disease in, um, that can affect different parts of the body. And you can see here this case in which the use of Biotron and only Biotron help with the, this, um, with the decrease of the psoriasis area and also about the gravity of, of the symptoms. So as I uh, told you, Biotron has already a big uh, number of publications explaining the cellular mechanism that we can see behind the clinical trials that we have with Biotron and the clinical success. <coughs> Until now, uh, Biotron has been mainly used by private customers. Uh, very few in some clinics and retirement houses to treat the depression of the elderly people, but uh, most of them for pain and for wound healing. And in the last year, we have increased our presence in hospitals. Nevertheless, the main use of Biotron stays private. So the next challenges that Biotron uh, we like to face, and we are uh, working very, very hard uh, on that, is, oh, sorry, uh, increase the use of Biotron in hospitals, clinics, and retirement houses. In a way, each device is not only helping one person or one family, but um, that it's helping quite a lot of patients with different pathologies, because as you have seen, with the same device, you can treat someone that, is, that has a big burn, but also people that have uh, chronic pain or uh, some uh, depression. For that, we are willing to collaborate even with CROs to execute new clinical trials, specifically in these hospitals, in a way <coughs> they can run a clinical trial, but they can also benefit from Biotron from the beginning. And one of the final objectives of Biotron is to show the economic impact of the use of Biotron. Until now, we have had some uh, input some of some clinics and retirement houses in which they were earning money thanks to the use of Biotron. For example, in the case of wound healing, a wound that is open for years required a lot of personnel, a lot of uh, drugs, a lot of dressings. With the use of Biotron, we can um, uh, save all that money, even uh, in a national level. So one of our objectives is to establish partnerships to um, assess this eco positive economic impact of the use of Biotron. 
So thank you very much for the time and I'm ready for questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sara. And uh, I hope that you are recovering very soon and I trust that it's not COVID. And thank, thank you for you. making <laughs> this uh, effort of uh, giving this really great presentation <laughs> and uh, overlook on uh, different uh, light therapies. Before I go to the famous epic question, we have one question which I think relates very much to this slide from Didier from uh, Lambda X. Didier, would you like to ask a question? I can, yes, uh, because you, you say it's uh, clinically tested. What does that mean in, in practice? Do you need to have a dual blind experiment like for uh, for drugs? Or uh, I, I'm not really aware of this. Can you elaborate yes. on this? Yes, of course. So even if we are a medical device, we need to run clinical trials as for the drugs. So in the studies that we have, it's mainly, it's a randomized, clinical trial, not always double blinded, but at least um, one yes. And of course it's minimum with two arms studies. So when we say clinically tested, means that we have clinical trials and we have applied for the medical certification for these uses. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have Bunga from Light3 Ventures here with us, also working on development of different uh, light therapy technologies. Bunga, within your organization, do you also support uh, clinical trials? Or maybe you can tell us a few words. Hi, Elena. Thank you so much for uh, the stage. And also, Sarah, it was a really great presentation. And uh, first of all, uh, my name is Bunga. I'm from Latu Ventures. We are from the Netherlands. So nice our company you. basically uh, do research and develop and also manufacture life therapy devices from beauty, wellness, health, also medical. So we are a um, one-stop shop company. So we are not only focusing on like medical device. So we also have a lot of uh, companies working with us, um, uh, especially in beauty companies. Um, also we work for like private label and uh, white, private and white label solutions. And here, um, because we are one-stop shop company, our company is um, also provide a uh, regulatory service so including like a uh, fda clearance so we want to make sure that our uh, the companies that work with us is also get their product uh, registered at fda or also mdr so every regulatory in this world we have our regulatory uh, board in-house so everything is one-stop shop so that's uh, what we provide in our company elena Thank you. Sarah, would that be something that you would also find helpful in your development and reaching the market, reaching the clinic? In that case, I think with um, with Bunga, it could be a great, um, <coughs> sorry, a great collaboration. Of that course, really, yeah. as she said, we have this uh, MDR that entered in force this year. Yeah. So we have somehow, how to say, <coughs> To be sure that all our documents are in line with MDR, we are already working on, uh, on that. And this is also one of the reasons why we like to run other clinical trials, because even mm -hmm. if we have some, of course, this is why we are medically certified, uh, the requirements are different. And um, the quantitative measures, for example, that medical quantitative data that we can get now is not the same that we can get 10 years ago because things are going very fast. So of course, this, this will be great. Um, so I will, if you agree, I keep your, your contact that we can, sure. we can go ahead because we are looking for some collaboration mm -hmm. that support us in that sense. Mm -hmm. As you saw, we are medically certified for quite a lot of things. Um, mm -hmm. So then we have to be focused in, in some of them. Um, but of course, yes, 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 this is super interesting for us. Yeah, fantastic. So, so yeah. let's see on one of next uh, of our meetings to see the success story happening. But let's create a few more here. So for that, I'm coming with that famous epic question to you, Sara. So um, it goes as what you can do for them and what they can do for you. So we have our network of 750, no, actually already more companies uh, developing different photonics technologies. <coughs> and so many of them are here in the room willing to help you to make your product even better. So if you're looking not just clinical application and clinical studies, I mean, uh, but more on the technology side of it. So how they can help you? What is their from technology perspective that you still are looking to improve? Do you have, like Patrick came to us earlier uh, in the meeting, a Christmas wish list? So 
So uh, for that, um, unfortunately, I don't have it um, uh, from the, this is more for the technical department and I'm sorry, I'm not exactly aware about that. So for the inputs that I can have, it will be uh, interesting perhaps um, regarding the bulb, so regarding the optical part of, uh, of the devices and also um, for the filters. So we have a specific requirements for the filters. We have a specific molecule, the fullerene, included in. And I know they are manufacturing uh, the filters and sometimes they have some requirements that it will be more for the optical part, as far as I know, and also uh, for, for the filters. But this is something that I can come back to the technical department in case they have a specific ones. Uh, because I'm from the medical one, so I don't know all their requirements. But of course, we are already um, we are always willing to to improve our devices. We have a new uh, model, this B Pro, this B two that I present you for hospitals. Uh, we have an old model, an old model. We have the classical model, let's say, and we have a new one that we launched some months ago uh, with a lot of improvements. So we are always willing to to improve. So of course. Sara, uh, first of all, uh, muchas gracias. Thank you so much for a great gracias, presentation. I, I, am, I am really happy talking to you because I, I know you from different frameworks and it's really great that we are connecting today. Uh, the reason we brought you to this meeting is because you play a very important part in the, in the manufacturing of photonic devices in Europe. Uh, you are really, first of all, the success story. And second, the platform that allows us to bring different optical components to, to the market or light therapy, which is a very interesting, very important market that you explain in your presentation. So what I would like to communicate to my 758 friends behind me is how, how to work with you. How can we bring the, the S-Weird camera systems of Lambda X? How can we bring the, the laser diodes or Lumix? How can we bring the Raman spectroscopy solutions uh, to, to, to you? Is there, is there a way in which we can try new things towards the Bioptron 2.0? So uh, for bioptron devices, as I tell you from a technical point of view, I'm not the best option, but <coughs> as I told you, bioptron takes part of the scepter group in which they have several products. So we have other products that are not managed directly by bioptron, but that takes part of the big company uh, that are LADs, for example, Medolite. And of course, uh, our president is always looking for new devices or new technologies that can improve our pipeline. So uh, for Biotron specifically, I cannot tell you today, but of course those devices can take part of um, the Scepter Group pipeline uh, perfectly because we are always looking for other medical devices to increase our medical branch. Anyways, if you have some technical improvements that you think could be beneficial or that we can collaborate, um, of course, be in touch with me and I will put you in touch with my with my technical department. That two be two Spanish to. people outside Spain working on the 6th of December, so we have to do our best. Uh, Sara, I would like to introduce you to another friend of mine. Uh, coming all the way from, from Denmark, the company, uh, so Sweden, the company Lumix, <laughs> Beate Sauter, Beate, Beate, long time no see, she's nodding, no, 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 I, you know that I'm not going to allow. And you say no, no, no. Beate, when you, you just seen the presentation of Bioptron, we are all very excited about light therapy. Lumix is one of the success stories that we have in Epic or laser diodes for medical. Uh, what resonated with you? How do you see light therapy as an application for the, for the Epic members, from the light laser diodes, the optics, to the scanning? So how I say... No, no, Sara, it's Beate, and she's going she's gonna <laughs> to challenge you, and then we can go back to you. Beate, so great to see you smiling, Beate. Yes, what's, thank, what's on your mind? Thank you, Jose. So light therapy, actually laser-based light therapy, is since many years one of our, our strongest markets within the medical device industry, which we are supplying with our laser diets. So we know quite a bit about it. So I have actually, I have, but as we are a manufacturer of high power diets, not, not necessarily uh, the, the lower power devices, which, uh, which Sarah mentioned, I have a few questions for, for uh, Sarah. So um, 
you mentioned that uh, your devices are based on incoherent light, so they are non-invasive, they work with low energy. So how, how do you, I was questioning myself, how do you ensure the, the necessary penetration depth, which is sometimes just needed to, to, to get to the point where you need uh, the, the, the creation of, of energy? And how do you deal with the, the peak energy you need and, and maybe a relatively short on time to, to speed up the treatment to not make it unnecessary long? So for the first question, for the penetration, um, this is an estimation. So we estimate that the light is going until three millimeters. The combination of all, as I told you, is going since 350 until 3,400. So then it depends, if we go in details, it depends of which part of the body you are irradiating. The penetration will be different because it will be different um, uh, quality of tissue with different chromophores that will absorb and diffuse the light in different in different way. But in like a mean range, we estimate that is around three millimeters. Mm -hmm. Then the characteristics of the light are fixed, okay? We cannot modify the density. We cannot modify, I mean, the user cannot modify these um, characteristics. So like this, we are sure that at least this penetration is three millimeters. I don't know if I answered to your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I understood the And then uh, if I understood properly, you are asking about uh, where is the peak of energy that will ensure that we are not irradiating too much? Yeah, in confrontation to the many high-powered uh, devices which are in this market, specifically working in hospitals. Um, so we have never done a comparative study in which we compare a group using Biotron, control group, group using a laser, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So this I cannot exp I cannot tell you, okay, a laser or a biotron will be 30% faster. What uh, people are doing uh, for, from private use, but also in hospitals, they um, we don't have any side effect until now in 30 years in the mm -hmm. market. So people irradiate the region that they want to treat until they don't have any more the pathology for which they were treating. <clears throat> for example, if someone is treating a wound that it's open, mm -hmm. they will stop. The ideal is to stop it once the wound is completely closed. But we know that people, when they see good results, they say, okay, then, uh, then it's fine. Then there is people, for example, that have chronic pain, like arthritis. Um, if they stop to use it, because we are not curing the arthritis, we are dealing, helping the people to deal with the symptoms. If you stop, to use, the same, to use it, of course, the symptoms will continue. So there is people that will use it their whole life. Um, so then we know that there is an acceleration of them, but for example, in the wound, we have this, uh, these groups in which we see an acceleration of the healing. Uh, in, the, in the domain of pain, that is very wide, that is very subjective, the pain also is done uh, comparative, uh, the pain, subjective pain, of course, and uh, also the motion of the joint that are normally normally used. And we see that is an increase in the motility. So we are helping the people to, to that. But normally we don't have any comparative studies, so I cannot tell you what is better. Um, mm, because I, I could imagine that uh, maybe maybe the high power devices and your lower power devices would would even be able to to complement each other of course because because lots of people to go to the <coughs> go to the therapist once a week or once a month and to do a high power treatment and then they would like to to continue the treatment at home where obviously uh, maybe 30 40 watt is 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 not really what what you want to do or let people have doing them at home of course this is what i i yeah. always say i mean it's not exclusive um i mean like every of us if we have a whole treatment in which you can combine mm -hmm. five things that will have a synergic effect why not one of the things that what biotron uh, proposes to continue to be treated at home uh, we have clinics in which they cannot have all their patients every day to be treated 
So they are leaning or they are, the, 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 the patients are buying Biotron. They continue to go to the clinic, as you say, to be treated of to go for physical therapy or for cryotherapy. And then they continue to use Biotron as, as complement. When I saw that both Beate and Sarah registered for this meeting, my Santa Claus Christmas list was for two you, or you to talk to each other. And you did. You need to talk also offline because obviously uh, Lumix is all success story in Epic on light therapy. Beate, before I let you go, one question for you. Is there a challenge uh, when it comes to the optics that are used for light therapy from the Lumix side as a laser diode manufacturer? So not so much for us because we we simply uh, supply the let's say the light source but i know from a couple of my customers that uh, they look for uh, some really fast um, f fast adjusting optics where where they can uh, adjust the focus which which in the end influences then again the the penetration depth that's at least what i hear and that what, what why my question was about penetration depth mm -hmm. because of course we talk not only about <coughs> with our customers about three millimeters we we really talk about a much much deeper penetration depth which is uh, also related uh, to the to the wavelengths and and uh, to the spot size and uh, to the to the peak energy level which which we try to address from mm -hmm. the laser side with our multi wavelengths uh, modules but well, of course of it needs it needs optics as well to to get the most out of it this whole multi-wavelength module is one of the success stories that we have in the network. So first of all, congratulations on what you are doing. Really, really, truly, you and Nick are really stars of this network. I want to uh, go with you, Beate, together to, to Jena, because I'm quite excited about what is happening there on the optics for the medical mm -hmm. segment. We have a spherical in the room, and Thorsten and Stefan really said, if you want to talk about optics for light therapy, I want to show one slide. Thorsten, your time to shine. Tell us how you can help this supply chain. Thanks, Jose, uh, for this nice introduction. I'm uh, Thorsten from Jena, working at Aspherican as a sales engineer and uh, product manager for what we call beam shaping or beam tuning. And um, some people might already know Aspherican as a manufacturer of uh, aspherical, spherical lenses or cylinders or as cylinders or what else. Uh, so every every kind of optical component that might be needed. And uh, I have condensed everything to one slide. And uh, this is uh, what we call, uh, uh, you, you see my screen? No? Not yet, it's coming, it's here. Okay. Control, press control L so we can see full screen. Or just go ahead, it's fine. Okay, it's fine. Okay, so um, so we are a manufacturer of optical uh, components. I uh, to, as I told already, uh, so we have not no medical products um, which we place into the market directly, but uh, we have an interesting application uh, which has been developed together with the Crayol uh, from the University of Florida, Florida, and uh, what you see here is uh, what we call a top shape, which is a beam shaping uh, element. Uh, consisting of two spherical lenses. And what we are doing here is manipulate uh, the light, the light of a laser in this case, and we can transform it from a Gaussian beam profile uh, into a, a, a flat top beam, as you can see it uh, on the left side. And what you see in the middle here is the microscope setup uh, from the Crayle Institute in Florida. And uh, um, the setup has been built up for the two different wavelengths, 638 and 561 nanometers. And the light goes through our top shape uh, component here and is transformed, as I told you already, from a Gaussian beam to a flat field beam. Um, the problem that has been solved here is that when you um, using a, a, a laser light, which is typically a Gaussian beam for a so-called turf microscopy, uh, which is called uh, or which is a total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy. Uh, you have uh, <clears throat> you have uh, such shadows uh, 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 within the uh, flat field uh, within the illuminated areas, and when the images are stitched together, you have the you have uh, 
yeah, these darker areas within the pictures, and this can be uh, uh, eliminated when you use such a top shape beam. Uh, and these are the two images uh, generated with a Gaussian beam and uh, generated with uh, our top shape uh, component here. And there you can see that uh, the illumination is uh, quite uh, homogeneous here. And this is what the component looks like. It's very compact in comparison to other beam shaping component, components available in the market. So this, this element has an overall length of uh, 39 millimeters and uh, 30 millimeters uh, in uh, diameter. Um, it's, a part of, it's a part of our beam uh, uh, tuning uh, product uh, range. And there are other components available uh, which are easily uh, to combine with such an element. Uh, we have uh, beam expanding or beam shrinking components, which can be combined, uh, collimators, and a lot of other components, uh, starting from uh, lenses with the housing, which is compatible with this housing, and so on. So uh, this is very uh, f flexible system, and we are planning uh, uh, um, more products for the uh, beam shaping in the future. And uh, yeah, we have uh, two different options uh, uh, which uh, generate uh, uh, stable beam profiles with a, a propagation range up to 300 millimeters and uh, up to 1000 millimeters here. And um, yes, we, what uh, uh, um, this uh, element demands is, uh, let's say, uh, very, uh, stable uh, input beam, but we are a little bit scalable too. Uh, uh, when it comes to the diameter, uh, uh, we accept the plus minus 10% of the input beam diameter. And of course, such an element can be customized too. Yes, that was it from my side. I hope this can be a little bit uh, of inspiring when it comes to beam shaping uh, for imaging applications. Uh, maybe somebody is here who is uh, manufacturing microscopes or similar things where such an element can be uh, integrated. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, I think we can integrate it in many different devices and uh, get advantage out of that. And we actually did see now that uh, there are so many different innovations which uh, photonics technologies can bring into medical devices and uh, to, to, to build a new uh, and to reach new applications. And uh, actually, we also he did hear through the meeting already that it is rather challenging and sometimes to bring together the full supply chain to build a new device. That's a really challenge. And that's also a challenge which is being recognized on a higher level, on EU level. So um, with the next presentation coming here, that would be also a recognition from the EU that we do need uh, some forces to be put together to build a new technology uh, to, to build new medical devices and that photonic technologies are actually taking quite a central role in there and uh, with that I want to give the floor to Davids who is business developer from Medfab and tell us a few words about this uh, new pilot production opportunities uh, for photonic based medical devices thank you very much and you should be able to see my full screen there hopefully yes fantastic it's clearly well, yeah. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Alina, for that. And also, Jose, for your always enthusiastic support of everybody here. Um, it, I'm actually delighted I managed to speak last because I got to see a lot of very exciting technology and it brings me back to my own research days. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm uh, the business development manager um, for uh, MedFab. I'm actually, it's my day job as well when I work in Ireland in the Tindall National Institute, which is an institute in Cork. And my specific area is IPIC, which is a photonics, the National Photonics Centre in Ireland. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. This is the community we're exactly looking to support. There's a couple of things I already I spotted from listening there, even with Patrick and from IQ Endoscopes. Uh, it was very fascinating for me to understand about the single use, um, but also some of the challenges you listed, and I'm actually going to refer to them later. Uh, and Fred from, from Accubane, um, there's a couple of things, elements there too, that um, we find very interesting. And, and, and funds being a challenge for everybody, I'm sure that's the case. And that's why we're here as well, to help companies like yourselves, and I'll, I'll address that later too. So, so what is MedFab? Well, MedFab is uh, Europe's first photonics pipeline dedicated to medical devices. We're here, and I work actually with Alina, I should say. Alina's a fantastic support for MedFab. She's one of our, 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 our team members, so it's, it's great to be speaking with her here today. She knows as much about this as everybody. 
Um, we, we're here, we, we support and grow the supply chain from all the way from component manufacturers. So if you're here and you, you don't need to make anything new, but you want to supply, we're here to speak to you too. We're having from, uh, component manufacturers to startups uh, to multinationals where we try to help with um, de-risking some of the new devices they want to bring in or even with OEMs to help introduce new capabilities. And we're also here to work with investors and, and investors are here to, we're here to help you to access the biggest amount of individuals in Europe and companies to support people like here today, people listening to help you get investment into what you're doing and we're going to enable you using that money as best as possible through our network. We're also here to provide a bit of training um, and we'll explain that a little bit now, but also at any stage you want to reach out to us, we're here as an organization, a broad organization to help with terms of accreditation of getting your devices made in a regulated environment. But ultimately, it's this last line what we're here to do. We're here to help you reduce your R&D costs and to help you accelerate commercialization. So we're a, we're a big, broad family here, um, multiple RTOs, multinationals, SMEs, and we also have clinical support. And on top of that, we have people like Epic and Amirez who help us with not only getting out to everybody here, like yourselves, but also to help ourselves understand the best messaging we're trying to give. So we're not siloed, we're not one individual group, we are all contactable individually, but as a group, we're here to help you develop where you're trying to go. And you can see some very interesting partners in there to help you manufacture and commercialize um, uh, your, your work. So we have a, a broad range of capabilities in this group. We're here to help you if you want to come to us with ideas and challenges that you have, we're here to help you across all these areas here. And I just picked a number of them. But ultimately, what we have is ISO regulated environments in which we can incorporate things that you want in your technology or to help you bring that forward. So we have multiple uh, technical applications here, but we're also here to help you in terms of a networking sense to introduce you to the partners that we have and to investors. And ultimately, we have a list of all our technologies that is available to the public and will be available to you too to look at. We're trying to help you understand your technology and what you might be able to help you to bring to the next stage of your commercialization. Um, so what's the key element of working with us? So what is MedFab? And we're originally funded by Europe, but we're actually a pilot line accessible to everybody in the world, but primarily we're able to financially support you from Europe. Uh, we've 18 partners, but you can contact us very easily to a single point of contact, which is the MedFab front office. And we have a website and you can find everything after this talk. That if you want to talk to any of the partners individually, you can still reach out to us there, or you can talk to any of us individually through the, through the website as well. Um, just offline. Um, one of the, the main benefits, speaking to us though, we find anyway, is that if you have a project or an idea, we help you place it on an innovation maturity map, which allows you to understand where you are in between a TRL and MRL, which is manufacturing readiness level, where you are on that journey. And our partners are really, really good at doing that. So just before I go there on how, how it actually works in practice, this is how it would affect you. So if anybody here, and including RTOs, I should say, and wants to come speak to us, we'll go straight to the front office. And if you have a technical idea, we have ISO certified companies and RTOs of this technology who all discuss amongst themselves where your um, product or service will end up on that kind of map. Now we are here to, it's all under NDA. So if there are partners you don't want to see it, we have the processes in place that they won't see it either. So this is not just going to anybody. This is all controlled by you. One of the other major advantages of MedFab, and it's because we have, they're in our group, but also we have a wonderful context within our group, is the other European Commission um, pilot lines that are out there, such as PIXAP, which is one of our founding members. We have contacts with those also, and they have supply chains and accesses to other companies that maybe you don't have yet, and we're here to help you do that. This is um, where we position projects, and we tailor the projects for your needs. So if you look at these five sort of levels increasing from maybe a quick project is low cost to help you maybe do some basic information all the way up to high manufacturing. We're here to support you along this journey and to tailor our outputs with that. We then, and this is actually for example, this is a perfect thing to approach us with. This came from the talk earlier today. This is the perfect thing. Just approach us with something like this. It doesn't have to be totally detailed. And say, these are the things we're looking for. And we help you position questions like this, which came from earlier on along this map. One of the best things that I have seen from being a former researcher and also working in industry 
is this map that the, we've produced along with our partners. Whereas you can see with increasing maturity where projects might sit. But we backfit this in looking at what you're bringing to us and we position you along this map. So you might come along, which is what I have experienced a lot, is a very high technical uh, readiness level. So a, a, a technology that's next generation, truly cutting edge. However, the assessment from the engineering team within our group can tell you where it really fits along here. So it might be really highly advanced, but in reality, in the real world, won't be able to be made at scale. And that can be one of the most valuable pieces of input for any company, whether it be an SME starting out seeking funding or all the way to a multinational. So you might be able to sidestep years of advanced work to go back, have to go back and do it again in manufacturing. And I think it's one of the best uh, capabilities within a MedFab. And I think one of the best things I've seen from Philips have produced this slide is that this is where an awful lot of people thought they were, um, where their marketing might've said they were, but actually where they found themselves to be, which is relatively high technology, but actually very low on a manufacturer readiness level. And this is one of the benefits we can do. Um, one thing we have is funding. Um, and we're not here just as a funding organization. We're here already operating as a pilot line. But from starting, we're starting this year, but ends at the end of next year, at any time you can apply through a pre-screening phase, just any time you want to try and get funding, it's up to 125,000 euros available, three quarters of which can be funded um, to SMEs and 50% of which can be funded for multinationals, all based in Europe and the UK and some other countries as well associated with European law. You can go to the website here, but you can see this on any MedFab website. And we help you with this sort of funding level here. So you can imagine here if the max contribution is up, 125,000, that can be 25% of the project. And then all you have to do is fund, so 75%, all you have to do is fund 25% of the project and 50-50, it's a multinational. So not only are we an existing pilot line already, in this early phase for the next year or so, we're here to try and help you get work co-funded. And I think in reality, when I look at the work that's been done already outside of this, we're a very cost-effective organization as it is now. So um, the great thing is everybody here, and I can see for the team that, uh, or the groups that Jose and, and, and Elena put together, there's a huge group of individuals here with all sorts of needs, be it from administrative support to, to, to funding support and technical support. And the MedFab team here is willing to speak to you at any stage. So questions now is fantastic. That's great. But um, if you want to speak offline, um, Elena knows all my contact details, obviously, and we would love to talk to you at any time. Thank Thanks you very much, very much David. I, I don't think we should uh, have a, a discussion about the way that the pilot line works, but the message is clear. The message is clear. We can help, thanks to the European Commission, we can help the manufacturing, the training, and of course, also the certification to any medical instrumentation based on photonics. And we can do that thanks to the amazing work of MedFab. So any company who needs from R&D to any component to make sure that they can reach the medical market, come to us. And in the MedFab website, you have all the list of all the components that go from fibers to optics, to packaging, to flexible electronics. All this is there as a catalog. Have a look at the MedFab website. And if you need any of those, I can help Help you get it because the European Commission is behind us. David and all the MedFab team, you're doing an amazing job. You are very important for Europe. You know, this meeting for us was a very important meeting because Serena and me really wanted to match, really wanted to match the challenges of four key markets right now in biophotonics with solutions from the network. And we did our best the last two hours. Let me just summarize. We had endoscopy with IQ endoscopy and Carl Storr told us about new materials needed for disposable optical endoscopy. And that's a reality now. In vivo imaging, Acubain really is working on laser diodes and their very, very small power consumption and heat dissipation. They operate on the battery. Then we had enough tech with the smart ophthalmic. They need a fast shutter. They need to focus. They need small eye trackers, but they are making the steps toward there. And last but definitely not least, the start of the show today was Bioptron, and they are looking for partners. Today we have Sarah talking to us about the increasing medical trials, and luckily we have Hospital and Epics to help, to help her with that. With this, I would like to say to all of you, thank you for being Epic, and thank you for helping Epic making a difference on the medical market. You are Epic. Oh, sir, I guess you need to also live narrate this video as it comes without the sound. You know, the video is the least important thing. 
what is really important is that we really work really hard from from all corners to make sure everyone everyone find business this concludes the public part of the meeting so all of you at this moment if you need to leave we are no longer live in youtube please disconnect the youtube the meeting is now private which means i can undo my tie i love this part